I hope you took that to heart. Sometimes we get to a point where we think, okay, I'm finished, I'm done. I'm ready to let somebody else do stuff. But, uh, you know, God never gets through with us until he calls us home. And there's a lot for us to still do. The title of the message today is A Faithful Saved. A Faithful Saved. And we'll be reading one verse of Scripture found in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, verse 15. The uh, verse will be on the uh, screen. You'll stand for the reading of God's Word. Paul is talking here. He's writing to young Timothy. And this is what he is saying to not only to Timothy, but to all those that are listening. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. In the pastoral epistles, the pastoral letters, which is 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, Paul is writing to young Timothy and to others that are going into the ministry, and he is teaching them in those three different letters. And he comes to a point where he wants to tell them, listen, and he says this several times, this is a faithful saying. This is a true saying. This is a saying that most people know, people are aware of, and you can count on it. In our day and time, I remember there used to be uh, the phrase goes around, you can take it to the bank, which means you can count on it. Well, this is one of those things that you can count on. And he says that it is worthy of all acceptation, which is just an added emphasis that Paul is writing here. saying, listen, the faithful Satan is worthy to be accepted. Pay attention. Take it to heart. Don't let it get away from you. And then he goes into what he has to say with the rest of the verse. And as we break this down, and I'm going to just take a few moments this morning to break this down because we've got communion, and this will help us prepare for the Lord's table. You know, Paul always warned us, and so did Jesus, that if we approach communion, the Lord's table, in an unworthy manner, it can be life-threatening to us. Paul even said many had died because they just took it lightly, took it for granted, didn't really realize what they were doing. Uh, they kind of just eat instead of, you know, breaking bread together and remembering Christ and what he did. And so Paul is breaking this faithful saving down, which is worthy for our acceptation on a day like today, which is the first Sunday of the month that we uh, have communion. Let's break it down real quick. First thing that I see in this verse of Scripture is the person. Christ Jesus came. Christ Jesus came. This was God in the flesh. This was the Word in the flesh. The Gospel of John tells us in the first chapter that the Word became flesh. He dwelt among us. And he's really saying, okay, this is what God is trying to teach us. This is what God is kind of trying to say. I have come in the flesh to show you how serious God is about what he's trying to say to people. What he's trying to tell us. That he loves us, but that we're sinners, and that he's trying to redeem us. And so here we see that Christ Jesus, we know him in many different aspects. Uh, we like to say we've invited Jesus to be our Savior. We've been born again. I was talking to a Jewish person this week and said that uh, they had been born again. And I thought, well, I've been that all this all, for many years. And they knew I was a preacher. They knew I was a pastor. And they said, have you been born again? And I said, yeah, a long time ago. I said, I've been a child of God since I was about 15, 15 and a half when I invited Jesus into my heart and life. 
And this was all new to them. And they was asking, somebody had told them to read the book of Colossians. I never tell a new Christian to read the book of Colossians. It's either going to be the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of John. I prefer the, John, the Gospel of John, telling somebody brand new to read. But the Gospel of Mark is a little bit easier uh, to understand and grasp. Uh, Christ comes to earth and Christ's uh, ministry and Christ's death and everything than maybe John's gospel is. But either one of them is good. But somebody told them to read the book of Colossians and give them a little bit of a, some kind of a commentary. They sent me a picture of the commentary and I uh, was familiar with the background of the writers but not with that particular commentary. And it's having a hard time said, can you explain it? I said, you want me to explain the whole book of Colossians to you? They said, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll outline it and I'll send it to you. So it took me a little bit of time and I outlined the first chapter of Colossians and I sent it to them. And they loved it. They said, well, what about the second chapter? So the next day or so, I outlined the second chapter, sent it to them. I thought, okay, I'm done. No, no, they wanted the third chapter and then they wanted the fourth chapter. But they were learning and they had a hunger for getting to know Christ and their responsibility uh, as a new Christian. They grew up Jewish. They had the Jewish background. Matter of fact, they were going to fly to Israel here in the next few weeks. And uh, now they have their new faith to be able to help them through that. I thought that was pretty awesome. Uh, I kind of felt sorry for them because they started listening to all my sermons on... Uh, on the video on our website. And I thought, oh gosh, you're running for punishment, aren't you? But, uh, but I, I was thrilled with the hunger of their faith. And here we see that Christ Jesus came. We know him as Savior. We should know him as Lord. You cannot really know him as Savior without knowing him as Lord. Uh, you know, he came to save us from our sin. But to be able to save us from our sin, we must recognize that He is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, that He is Lord. And when you invite Jesus to come in, you can't just say, Jesus, come in and save my soul so that I can go to heaven when I die. You have to add to that the commitment, you are going to be Lord of my life. And so many people out here says, I'll pray and ask Jesus into my heart because I want to go to heaven when I die. I don't want to go to hell. But I'm not sure about this Lord business. That means he's got to be in control. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have a hard time with anybody that wants to say, okay, I'm saved, but I don't want Jesus to be my Lord or don't want to live as if he's not my Lord. Now, I grant it, once we become saved and become part of the family of God, become a true believer, we're still going to mess up. We're still going to have sin in our lives from time to time because of our actions and because we're still in the flesh and we're growing. But for somebody to say, I'm saved, and that's it. And they're not trying to pray. They're not trying to read the Bible. They're not trying to be involved in the church that Christ has built. He says, I'm going to set up my church so that the world will know who I am. And if you're not interested in that, but you're claiming Christ, I'm kind of like Billy Graham. Billy Graham said... He thought of all the people that claimed to be Christians, only 20% were really Christians. Billy Graham's a pretty smart guy. And I've been in the ministry over 40 some years and I find, I agree with him on that. I find a lot of people that are, like to claim to be a Christian, claim to be spiritual, but it's not true. Not true at all. And we struggle with the simple things of showing forgiveness, showing love, Showing mercy, having these part of our attributes of our lives. I don't know if we've been changed. When we invite Christ to come into our heart, it says we become a new creation, a new creature. We're not like we used to be. We are different. Not that we have to prove it to anybody, but we know in our own hearts that we're different. And if we don't see any difference from the way we used to be to the way we are now, you may just have an emotional experience. 
You may just felt guilty that Sunday. And you didn't really have Christ to come in to be your Lord of your life. But from that time that you invited Jesus to come in and you are different and you are changed and you are striving and you know when you're doing sin and it bothers you, I say you've got Christ as Lord of your life. Listen, Christ left heaven where everything is perfect and chose to come to this old world to be God in the flesh so that we might know who God really is. And He did that because He loves us. And He loves us as His creation. He could have just wiped us out and started all over and said, I will do a better job next go around. But He chose to take that which He has created, which is us, and redeem us, buy us back from sin. And the only way to do that is to come to this old world, to become flesh and blood, and to pay this supreme sacrifice of dying on the cross for us. A great gift has been given me and you by Jesus' death. And if we take it for granted, we may not know him truly as Lord and Savior. And so as I see Paul sharing with Timothy this faithful saying, say, uh, saying that's worthy of acceptance, he started out by saying, Christ Jesus came. He came for us. As a babe in a manger, growing up in the flesh and dying on the cross for us. The second part of that verse says about the place. He came into the world. There's a lot of lovely things in this old world. A lot of amazing things. God created it. And I can imagine if we could go back to the time of Adam and Eve when they were in the garden before they got kicked out, where everything was perfect, how awesome that would be. And I can imagine from looking at what I see nowadays, I've had an opportunity to see a lot of beautiful places, lived in the mountains, came to the beach, see places like the Grand Canyon, which will amaze you, been to Niagara Falls. Why have you been to these places? I've even been through Little Whistle. <laughs> I'm just making sure you've been with it. I'll make sure you're listening. <laughs> and I know where the speed trap is there. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. clears throat> but there's a lot of beautiful places that I haven't seen, but I've seen pictures of. Some amazing things. But nothing compares to heaven. And Jesus decided to leave heaven and come to this old world that was becoming more and more wicked, more and more sinful, and because he loved us. Listen, folks. It tells us in Isaiah, chapter 9, 6, we usually read this Scripture around Christmas time, but it's appropriate for this. If I can see well enough to read it. Isaiah 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. What a great God came to this old world because He loved us. He came to you and me. He comes to us in our time of need. He comes to us in our times of hurts. He comes to us in our times when we feel hopeless and helpless. 
And he says, look up for your redemption to draw it nigh. He came to us, folks. So we see the person, Christ Jesus came. We see the place into this world. And we see the purpose of his coming to save sinners. Hard to imagine that the writer of most of the New Testament, more than anybody else, the Apostle Paul, considered himself chief of all sinners. But I can relate to that because the more we know about God, the closer we are to God, the more we see our sins. If we compare ourselves to one another, we compare ourselves to people in this world, we don't really see our sins. Because what we see is we are as good as they are. Uh, they are worse than we are. But any time we get down to business and look into the face of Jesus and we compare ourselves to Jesus and we are honest with ourselves, we realize there's nothing good about us. Nothing whatsoever. Romans 3.10, I've read this many times to you. We're all sinners. There's nothing good about us. Romans 3.10 tells us there's none that is righteous. Wow, not a one of us here today is righteous under our own. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Oh, you may be a little bit better than me, I might be a little bit better than you. We might be a little bit better than these out here in the world. There's some out there that might be a little bit better than us. But guess what? We all come up short when it comes to righteousness and holiness. That's why Jesus had to come to this old world. So he could save a sinner like me. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrated, He commended, He showed His love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This old world needs salvation. A lot of this old world don't realize they need salvation. A lot of this old world doesn't want salvation. But it is necessary. And it is needful. Because one of these days, this old world will come to an end. One of these days, our lives will come to an end. As we know it. And we will stand in judgment. And as sure as I'm standing here today, there's a heaven and a hell. And you will go to one of those two places. And I will too. And the only thing, according to the Word of God, that's not according to Ken, according to the Word of God, that makes a difference is Jesus Christ being Lord of our lives. And we come today to break bread together. And we remember the body with the bread that was bruised and beaten for us. And we take the cup to remember the blood that was shed. From the crown of thorns shoved on his hand to his back that was beaten with a whip to his hands and feet that the spikes were driven through and to the spear that was thrust in his side the blood was shed and he was sacrificed for us he gave his life for us and so this is a faithful servant saying it's worthy of acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And just like Paul, he says he's the chief of all sinners. And I say, I don't know about that, Paul, but I do know that we are all sinners.